Welcome to Independent Truths with Scott Atlas, my new show that brings a uniquely rational perspective to important issues facing us today. Today's guest is Dr. Martin Kulldorff. Martin is a biostatistician and epidemiologist and a professor in the Department of Medicine at Harvard Medical School on leave. And he, like me, is a founding fellow at Hillsdale College's Academy for Science and Freedom. Martin Kulldorff and I today will have an illuminating conversation on many things about the pandemic, including the bigger issues like the groupthink, herd mentality, if you will, and the solutions to preventing such thinking for future crises. Thanks for joining. Today we're here with Dr. Martin Kulldorff, uh, one of my new friends that I made during the pandemic. Martin is well known to most people, I think, in the uh, era of the pandemic. He is a biostatistician, an epidemiologist, and a professor in the Department of Medicine at Harvard University Medical School on leave. He is also a founding fellow at Hillsdale College's Academy for Science and Freedom. Dr. Kulldorff, his uh, research centers on developing and applying new statistical methods for disease surveillance and post-market drug and vaccine safety surveillance, obviously critical topics these days, as well as research on the early detection and monitoring of infectious disease outbreaks. Dr. Kolderf's methods are used by the FDA and the CDC to monitor drug and vaccine safety and by most federal and state public health agencies around the world, as well as by many local public health departments and hospital epidemiologists. Perhaps most of our listeners know Martin as a co-author of the Great Barrington Declaration in October of 2020, where he, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, and Dr. Sunetra Gupta advocated for a pandemic management strategy of focus protection instead of widespread lockdowns. Dr. Kolderf received his bachelor's degree in mathematical statistics from Umea University in Sweden and his doctorate in operations research from Cornell University. Before Harvard, Dr. Kolderf worked at Uppsala University in Sweden, at the NIH, and at the University of Connecticut. And welcome, Martin. Thank you so much, Scott. It's a great pleasure to talk to you. Great to see you again. Um, we have so much to talk about and uh, only about a half hour, so we'll I'll start with the key question, really, uh, that initiates all of the conversations to me, and that is, what surprised you, what surprised you the most about the pandemic and the management of the pandemic? as we look at this really fiasco in public health? Well, the fact that we had a pandemic didn't surprise me because that's part of uh, life, so part of history, we get pandemics uh, now and then. Uh, so that was expected that will come sooner or later the next one, and we'll have more of them. What did stun me completely was that as the pandemic arrived, we threw out all the basic principles of public health out the window, ignoring them. Instead, making up uh, things uh, like lockdowns and uh, school closures and those things that uh, not only were uh, ineffective to deal with the pandemic, but also created a lot of damage, uh, uh, sort of collateral public health damage. Right. I mean, this was a, a shock to me, too. I think, you know, one thing we shared, uh, one thing we had in common was even though we had both worked for decades in medical science and scientific research at, you know, uh, very prominent institutions. So we thought we knew the system. I think we were both very naive. Uh, I, I just. I was certainly very naive uh, about this. And uh, it's astonishing the amount of. Uh, Heard thinking or uh, group think that went on that somebody says something and then everybody or not everybody but a lot of people just jumped on it and uncritically and then shutting down the scientific debate. Right. I mean, the essence of science that we had always uh, thought was about hypothesis-driven research, being wrong, being right, arguing or debating, 
based on the data, all of a sudden it turned into some kind of a, uh, what you call herd thinking. And I think that's, that's very accurate and also a, a, uh, an attempt to demonize, to vilify anyone who had an alternative view of things. And this, this was a, a shock to me uh, because no matter how much we debate in medical science, uh, it was never personal and it was never that because you're speaking against the consensus, you're dangerous. I think that, that, really, uh, that really stunned me. Science is the pursuit of the truth. And it's not always the direct way there, but the only way to reach it is through uh, debates and discussions and uh, comparing notes and uh, looking at thoroughly at different research studies and uh, also acknowledging when we don't know things. Right. It but somehow there were things that was deemed to be the science or truth, uh, which was not, uh, that went against longstanding principles of public yeah, health. Yeah, longstanding principles of public health long-standing principles really of pandemic management specifically as we know uh, you know the the standard pandemic management already had uh, really clearly stated that lockdowns a didn't work and lockdowns were extremely harmful this was 15 years before this pandemic and and also uh, the other thing that I, I don't want to really skip past is something you said which is there was a denial of fundamental biology as I, as I say often, this yeah. is really not even, it's not PhD level biology, it's not medical school level, it's not even college level, it's really senior year high school level principles of protection against consequences of secondary infection if you've already had the infection, you know, basic immunology things, not esoteric knowledge, this was denied. This was a big shock to me. Yeah, we've known about uh, infection acquired immunity or natural immunity since uh, 430 BC the, during the Athenian plague. So that knowledge is almost two and a half, uh, uh, two and a half thousand years old. And suddenly we have uh, established scientists who are questioning that, including the current CDC director. Uh, so uh, that's quite a surprising and uh, it's only interesting because the evidence of knowledge of the earth being round rather than flat is about equally, uh, well, we also know that for about two and a half thousand years. So those two pieces of knowledge are about equal, uh, we've known for about the same time. Yeah. And as I, Aaron, but to have university professors, uh, university presidents who require vaccine mandates for people who had COVID, that is de facto denial of, uh, uh infection acquired immunity. Uh, and to me, that's just as absurd as denying uh, that the earth is round rather than flat. Yes, I, I, I completely agree with you. I think uh, in so many ways, we have a new generation of flat earthers. And unfortunately, the flat earthers are the expert scientists in many cases, the people who are deemed experts because they have fancy university titles or they work at, at prestigious public health agencies like the CDC uh, the NIH. I mean, these are literally flat earthers who are denying. I mean, uh, at some point, uh, it's it gets a little bit frustrating. It's not just harmful. It's frustrating to have the discussion, to be honest, because you have people who are denying the data on, uh, for instance, masks. I mean, this is not something that should even be debated anymore. Uh, and I feel like the burden really shouldn't be on people like you and me to keep arguing that the earth is round. And so we, I, I, I sort of, I, I, in, a, in a sad way, I give up on that. The problem here, as I see it, is that we live in a society that rightfully acknowledges expertise based on your credentials and your experience. And that, that is why we trust experts. And I think that trust has really been destroyed and undermined and that does not bode well for future crises. Well, they don't deserve trust. So the fact that the trust is gone is that says it's a good thing. Yes, but I find it surprising that university professors uh, that they're not embarrassed by getting this thing wrong. That yeah. the editors of major medical journals that they're not embarrassed. That the heads of CDC and uh, NIH 
uh, that they're not embarrassed about this. They should be. Right, absolutely. I mean, it's, and, you know, it's, it's, it's of course, embarrassing to them. It's also the, the harms they imposed, uh, you know, as we yep. have said so often, particularly on the lower income families, minorities, the poor, uh, and the most vulnerable children and the elderly and people with disabilities by the school closures uh, really will go down as a black mark in the in the ethical failure, really, of public health leadership and, and of our society. I want to get to something. Uh, I want to go back to this herd thinking because, you know, m- much to my shock, another shock I, I was educated about by my colleagues in other fields was that, uh, you know, herd thinking uh, that we saw in the pandemic was not new. There's a historical sort of uh, a repeated history of this sort of group think. I'd like to get your thoughts on on that. Well, I've tried to, I mean, it's, it surprised me, but I've tried to think what other historical examples there are of mistaken herd thinking. And one obvious example is uh, Eugenics, which was popular about a hundred years ago, uh, and it was popular among uh, many sectors of uh, of the scientific community, uh, and it didn't sort of die down until it got completely uh, the uh, bad reputation from the from the Nazis in in Germany. Uh, but the other examples, for example, in mental health, the uh, they used in the uh, they used to drill holes in the skulls to to cut nerves, and uh, that was established uh, knowledge. Sort of, uh, uh, everybody thought that was correct. Yeah, I mean frontal and of course, lobotomy. Uh, you it, know. Uh, it was uh, uh, not only non; it was uh, it had it had no benefit effect, and obviously bad effects. Uh, there are other examples from today where uh, a few decades ago. Uh, somebody came up with some child support guidelines, and then that was copied by all other states. But uh, they, these guidelines have mathematical flaws, uh, but they keep they, they keep sticking to these guidelines. For example, uh, uh, I, I uh, together with Jay Barashaya, we wrote a paper for uh, for the it was published by the National Bureau of Economic Research, and uh, that the one state, if, if one parent makes 42,000 and the other ones make 30,000, they have 50-50 custody with equal of, of their two children, then the one who has makes 42,000 uh, a year pays uh, over $12,000 to the other one. So that they just sort of shift the, the amounts. So they're starving the children in one home to feed them in the other. Or another example from these guidelines is uh, uh, you have a father with two daughters with two different mothers. Uh, the older daughter, the mother, the father makes forty thousand. The mother of the older daughter makes eighty thousand, and the mother of the younger daughter makes forty thousand. But the father makes pays more child support to the mother that makes more money and less child support to the mother who makes less money. We're basically taking money from one daughter to give to another. Right. Guidelines are full of these absurd examples. Then it's sort of just group thing because somebody put it out there, and then uh, uh, it became the standard. And uh, people have pointed out that there's problems, but there's still the group thing and herd mentality that won't change right. this thing. So you uh, know, specifically, there are many examples uh, in, in science actually. But I think what was unique with the pandemic is sort of affected everybody. The thing that affects the mental health. Uh, uh, affected mental health patients and their families, but that's sort of a small minority. So the unique thing with the pandemic, I think, is that it's really affected the whole population. Exactly. And, you know, I also think uh, we can look in science specifically because we like to think biological science is the hardest, the hard science, as opposed to soft sciences like social sciences. But we look at, you know, we you talk about other historical examples. I mean, one is, of course, the barbaric frontal lobotomy uh, procedures that were done on psychiatry patients for decades in the United States and presumably in the world. Uh, And of course, the pandemic policies were truly barbaric, uh, particularly the severe lockdowns of a place like China. But this kind of lockdowns with massive harms were done in the United States and in other free countries 
uh, to, and I, I, I think the word barbaric is appropriate, but we also look at things that uh, have been completely cemented in stone for decades. And here I'm talking about things like nutrition guidance, where, uh, you know, when I was a kid, uh, the, the pyramid of food was pushing that you should eat more and more grains, more and more carbohydrates, and very avoid proteins, avoid meat, because this was bad for you. Uh, and this has sort of become, uh, you know, topsy-turvy now uh, with current thinking. And so, you know, this is where, uh, it, 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 you know, science, as we know, depends upon hypothesis testing. You know, research is supposed to be the free exchange of ideas. And uh, eventually, if the hypothesis is proven incorrect, uh, as Dr. Richard Feynman was famously quoted as saying, if your hypothesis is incorrect, you're wrong. It doesn't matter how many people agree with you. This idea somehow that has been put forward in the lay media as well as in science itself is that there's somehow a consensus uh, that is the proof of truth. That That is really not true. Now, I also do not think it's correct to say nothing is known. Uh, I mean, the earth is round. We don't want to forget the earth is round. We don't have to keep proving uh, and answering the people who claim it's flat. So, uh, you know, well, we we need to restore, as, as you and I talk about quite frequently, and I'd like to talk about uh, some of the things we're doing about it, uh, in a bit, we need to restore the free exchange of ideas because without that, there is no such thing as science. Yeah, even if you have, I mean, we have to let people sort of come up with uh, all kinds of contrary ideas or suggestions. And it, so even if you have 10 people who do that, that nine are wrong and one are right, we have to let those nine people also speak up because otherwise we won't hear from the 10th person. That's right. Um, so we shouldn't shut down those nine, but we should uh, engage with them in discussions and try to can, sort of show why they are wrong. Then, and yeah, and uh, this is... so we have to let uh, people. We also have to let people who are wrong to sort of uh, talk and let and have debates with them. That's right, and and I think this is something that uh, was the shock. Another shock was the true, uh, really demonization. The idea that if you're saying something different, you're not just wrong and you can be in the discussion is about the evidence. The discussion had nothing to do with the evidence in, in, in you know, particularly my own personal case, but also yours when people were saying we were dangerous and therefore we shouldn't be listened to. Uh, I mean, this is really the, the idea of ad hominem attack was brought to the extreme uh, and and it's very sad because in the end this really wasn't that complicated. I I don't think it this was very complicated. I actually don't think you needed to be a a trained scientist to understand that this was really just somebody with critical thinking would understand. Uh, some of these policies were truly absurd, like for instance the arbitrary policies of social distancing being six feet, the six foot rule. I mean, this is something that was truly arbitrary, so much so to the point where the American public still does not understand that many countries, and even the WHO, recommended three feet. Yet somehow this was a six foot was the magic number in the United States. Other countries use 1.5 meters. Switzerland used 1.5 meters, for instance. I mean, the, these things were so pseudoscientific and so variable, yet they were impressed upon people, as we see even today, still the residua of measuring markers on the ground in airports and in other public places. Yeah, it is absurd because somebody arbitrarily came up with six feet and then that was the gospel. And uh, then that led to other rules. For example, uh, in schools, the rule was in many in, in many states that each child had to have forty four square feet of space. Uh, so that's the most. Uh, so if you have had like uh, a, a classroom with eight hundred and eighty square feet, you could fit at most twenty students there. So that's not a completely arbitrary rule. And actually, one of the journalists, the great journalist named David Zweig, he wrote. 
a very entertaining and funny uh, description of how this came about, sort of going through. And there was somebody who came it up arbitrarily, and then there was some misunderstanding, and then everybody just sort of in, in a chain thing uh, uh, accepted there was 44 square feet per child. And that's what uh, schools used in many in most in many states. And there was absolutely no uh, uh, sort of there was just an arbitrary thing that somebody came up, but then everybody follows the herd. Right. Uh, everybody wants to do the same thing because that's what everybody else does. And it became uh, almost an obsession. I, I think a lot of these things have become obsessions. Frankly, I think there's an obsession, particularly where I live in California, but in several uh, parts of the country, with masks. There is a, an obs- a totally misguided, totally contrary to science. There is an obsession in some places, including at the highest levels of our federal government and agencies, with testing uh, for an illness uh, whose the latest data, the Johnny Anides group on the epidemiology in January of 2023 came out with and showed that for people who are not uh, in the high risk age group, the the fit, infection fatality rate is is less than influenza, uh, and we're not really uh, obsessive about influenza. I hope that doesn't mean we should become obsessive about influenza. Uh, I think we need to get uh, really back to sort of reality based. But I think a lot. I think it's going to be a long haul, and I I would like to sort of talk uh, about some of the solutions. I think you have some great ideas on how to fix science because science is broken. Public health is broken and it caused the breaking of it has caused a tremendous damage to the trust that we need in these institutions and in, in expertise in general. And I want to start that discussion by asking, if you will, to recount to the public uh the rea- you you have been many times an advisor and on external committees to the FDA and the CDC and other advisory uh, agencies. And I'd like you to, to refresh everyone's memory about what happened when you uh, made your recommendation about vaccines to one of, as a member of one of the advisory committees and how you were removed from the committee. Uh, and and what happened with that? Because I think this is an illustration of well, the, how broken and damaged uh, the these very important advisory agencies are in their roles uh, in our in our country. So I served on the CDC committee uh, on uh, the COVID vaccine safety uh, working group. And at one point in uh, 2021, uh, there was a discussion about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, the one-dose vaccine, uh, because there had been some uh, blood clots among uh, women under 50. And CDC decided to take to make a pause on, the, on this vaccine, which basically... Uh, 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 because of that, uh, the the demand for this vaccine plummeted. Went uh, within just just a few days. But I was uh, arguing that uh, uh, so so I wrote an op-ed in the in the Hill, arguing that uh, fine to pass it for 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 young women, but it's all the people who really need this vaccine. They uh, they are the ones who are at risk of dying. And the Johnson Johnson vaccine is a one dose. It's important to reach hard uh, to reach people like homeless people or rural people. So I was arguing that there should not be a pause on this vaccine for people over fifty. Right. Uh, and I wrote an op-ed about that uh, because I didn't feel I got heard. And CDC was not happy about that, so they removed me from that committee. Uh, very abruptly, and uh, I know that came from the highest level of CDC. And then um, the irony of all ironies, of course, uh, ensued. Yeah. So four dr- four days later, they removed the 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 pause on this uh, on this. So vaccine. they did exactly what but what you were the only person who was fired by CDC for being too pro vaccine. Right. So I guess that's an accomplishment yes, as the vaccine scientist. Yes, it is. And, you know, the, the point about talking about it is really, uh, I think the public needs to know 
and they still really don't. The state of things in the CDC, the FDA, and these very important agencies that we have entrusted with many things, including uh, you know safety and efficacy of drugs, but even in a crisis situation, uh, they were not functioning. And so this is just one part, uh, you know, of the broken science that we talk about, uh, which is that the the agencies not only were filled with incompetent people and denying the data and not being uh, forthcoming and transparent, but they also had been allocated power and authority instead of being advisory agencies. I think this is something that is a huge problem and a huge failure of leadership by two presidents in a row and by uh, really all those who are elected to be leaders at the state level, at the local level, uh, people were hiding, in my view, behind, oh, we'll do whatever the CDC says, which is not the role of the CDC and certainly, a, 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 again, a failure of leadership. But I'd like to talk about some of the things because you and I, along with our, our friend and colleague Jay Bhattacharya, are the three co-founding uh, fellows of Hillsdale Academy's uh, uh, Academy for, uh, Hillsdale College's Academy for Science and Freedom. And I think this is a very focused but critical, really urgent problem here. We need to fix science in so many ways. Uh, and I'd like to hear a couple of your thoughts on some of the key problems with science that we are going to focus on. Yeah, so I think that while the pandemic sort of exposed these problems in public health and medicine, I think it's a more wide uh, problem uh, in science. It's more in some fields, uh, less than others. But uh, it really came to the to, to the fore here with the, with the pandemic. I guess one example is that some of the most important studies during this pandemic about uh, uh, vaccines, for example, how, how long uh, vaccine efficacy lasts or uh, natural immunity versus vaccine immunity or masks or our children uh, uh, spread the disease or not came from countries in the periphery of, the, of, of science instead of the powerhouses of uh, the U.S. and the U.K. So it came from places like... Uh, Iceland, Denmark, Sweden, uh, Qatar, Israel. So small countries with uh, uh, sort of small wealthy countries with good scientists, uh, good infrastructure, but who doesn't sort of, it's not part of the same funding structure. So they're a little bit on the periphery. So many of the best studies came from those countries. So I think one problem we have is the enormous centralization of science, that it has to be more decentralized. So if you look at uh, Anthony Fauci, so he had very strong opinions about the public health of this pandemic, even though he's the lab scientist who doesn't know much about public health. But since he sits on the top of the biggest pile of infectious uh, disease research money in the world, it's hard to go against him. So instead even of when, so even when he's overtly wrong over and over and over again, it was very hard to go against him not because he was a compelling presented a compelling case as you're saying it's because of other reasons uh, that are sort of understandable and and I this is what I want you to articulate I did I didn't want to interrupt but I I think that the American public doesn't understand how science actually funding works and how science operates at all yeah so if you don't get your funding from uh, NIAID that Fauci leaves then you won't be able to feed your family or you won't be able to uh, uh, provide salary for the people working in your lab right every every so scientist have to be every academic scientist at a university essentially their career depends on getting NIH grants you need it for your promotion you need it to do your research you need it to get your publications done and this is a very, very centralized, and of course, their process, then all centralized processes are prone to malfeasance, whether it's overt corruption or error or simply a control of power. Yeah, so instead of one big NIH, uh, maybe we should have several small ones. And then if we have, for example, six of them, 
Well, if one is led by Anthony Fauci, that's okay because the other five are functioning. Right. We don't want to. Uh, we so don't want to replicate the no. Anthony Fauci led. Uh, uh, and, you know, NIH. No, that's not uh, what you're saying. What you're saying, of course, and I'm being funny there, but is to, that the decentralization will will eliminate some of this control and also generate, as as you like to say, some competition among the funding agencies, even. Yeah, they'll uh, if uh, five of them doesn't fund things, the the sixth one will. Uh, and then the other ones will find something else. So uh, I think that's, so that decentralization, I think, is critical. And the other another reason I uh, want to... You have sort of a cartel system within each field of, uh, of yes. science. Where right? there's a group of, uh, sort of leading scientists, they, uh, they dominate the funding committees and they dominate the, the reviewing for the journals uh, on this field so they can control it uh, quite well. And that's not a good thing for, for science to have this cartel system. And it's not one cartel for each science. It's like thousands of cartels, each one for each subfield. Right. Of I science. think another thing the American public doesn't understand about science research, it's not just that the actual approval of the funding is controlled and therefore the careers are controlled. It's also the topics of interest uh, that people are generally aware of and explicitly told what areas the NIH wants to fund. And most people, if I may uh, be so bold as to say that, most researchers look at the topics that have a higher likelihood of being funded and they actually write research to address that because, again, you need the funding to, to, do, to have your career advance. So, they're not just controlling the funding stream. They're not just controlling individuals. They're controlling actually the basic fields of research that are even investigated. Yeah, and I think that's uh, uh, that's a problem. Uh, I, I think that, and I think a better solution is actually instead of scientists writing grants or what they want to do or plan to do, a better solution would be to say, well, those scientists that have done good research in the last few years, uh, reward them for that and give them more money based on past research instead of future promises. As long as we can avoid the, the, the old boys' network. is much you know. more political. Yeah, it's, it's... Yeah, future promises is much more political. What you've done in the past is easier to judge more uh, uh, in a more unbiased manner. And if people have done good research in the past, they probably have very good ideas for doing good research in the future. Yeah. And it lets scientists uh, do the science that they think is most promising. Uh, because I know both me and many of my colleagues, we sort of have like a two-pronged approach. We have to get funding to pay our salaries by doing what sort of popular or what sort of in uh, or, 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 or that. But then to do the things that we think is the most important, sometimes we have to do that on the side without any funding. Yeah. I, but we still want to do anything that we think is most important, but that's not always fundable research. Yeah, so we need we need funding uh, that's diverse in terms of its origin, the decentralization. We also need funding streams that are uh, for, for different uh, sorts of research. Like you say, people who have experienced research careers uh, we want them to be incentivized to explore new areas because they know how to do research. And we also want young investigators funded without a, a significant background. And I think that, the, you know, this is all part of the decentralization, uh, that, that there's many, yeah. there's a more of a diversity of funding going on and the diversity of funders, meaning funding agencies. The other thing is the transparency, the, the scientific journal process. I want to I want to get into this with you because I think you have some creative ideas on this. Uh, one of them that bothers me, and then I'll I'll have you uh, give your views, is that it's sort of ironic that the anonymity of science research review, whether it's of grants or of papers, that was done so that people could feel free to you know be honest about the review of papers and research. But it I think. There's a danger, which we, I think we've seen, is that certain research is blackballed. Certain publications are blocked for no good reason because the reviewer is not accountable. And I, I like the idea of having some more accountability. If you're going to review a paper, have that review be more public, more disseminated. 
and I know you have other additional ideas on on uh, new new forms of journals and publications. I'd like you to talk about that. Well, I think the the journalist is part of the cartel system, uh, and it sort of bears sort of non serve a purpose anymore because it used to be that they were sent by mail in printed copies to libraries, so there was a limit on how much they could publish and so on. But I don't think there's any reason to have these journals anymore. I think. Uh, if you work at Stanford, why don't you just publish uh, your research on a Stanford journal, Stanford Journal of Medicine or something, and uh, the university should want its scientists to publish its research, so they should just be allowed to publish whatever they want in their own journal. And then we can have open peer reviews. Uh, peer review is important, but I think we can have so that uh, whoever does peer review will uh, not necessarily not decide whether they should be published or not, because if you're a scientist at Stanford, you should be able to publish your stuff, but to give com honest comment on it and do it openly so that everybody can read it. Yeah. Yeah. When I write a review now, it's read by just uh, two or three or four people, depending on how many co-authors there are on the paper. And that's sort of a waste of my time. It's more useful if I read, write it so that whoever reads the paper can then get sort of a uh, a second view on it from a different perspective. That I think is very useful. Yes. So we should we should publish the reviews together with the papers. Yes, I I, I really strongly I strongly believe in that. The the review I think it's we've had a good sort of move of rapid publication. That's that's sort of new compared to the way it was a decade ago. But I think that the publication review process should be public. It's a it's because actually, honestly, the discussion of the paper uh, is far more insightful often than the paper itself. I mean, we've all, I don't think uh, non-science people understand, but we have things in medical centers and in academic institutions that you and I have uh, worked at that are journal clubs. So someone brings a paper in, but the discussion, the dissection of the methodology of the study design itself is so critical to the validity of the conclusion. The analysis of the of the result is often an interchange rather than just the person who wrote it and that, like you say, the two or three reviewers of the paper. So I think moving toward, a, again, it's sort of decentralization, if you will, but a review process that is held in public, a discussion that is more transparent. I think this is all for the public good. In my view, again, I think we, we have to get break up what you call the cartel system, break up the behind closed doors science process and bring it forward, bring it into public view. It's all about transparency. Yeah, I agree with that. And uh, I mean, we have a situation now where if you publish a paper in one of the fancy journals, then you make a career and you can get promoted. It doesn't matter if the paper is good or not. Uh, it is just getting it into those, and that's part of being part of the sort of inner circle of the cartel. Uh, so uh, I don't think these journals serve any purpose anymore. Uh, and uh, so we're about to I start. I think if you write a paper, it's more it's more challenging to write it so that uh, whoever reviews it openly uh, will uh, find it to be solid uh, stuff instead of finding errors in it. Right. So just to uh, give a heads up to the people listening and watching is that we will be releasing a couple of new format uh, publications from the Hillsdale College Academy for Science and Freedom that uh, you, Jay, and uh, I are all uh, working with. Uh, and one of them will be uh, your journal that is still a work in progress at this point uh, with you as editor-in-chief. Uh, so I think that that's going to be some exciting new ground. And, and that's the point. We, we may not have the answers. Uh, we certainly don't have all of the answers, and we're not pretending to, but we know that there are serious problems with science, with the process. Science failed in this pandemic. The current people in charge of science failed abjectly in this pandemic and it harmed the public. Uh, and we, re we really need to uh, implement creative solutions. And I think there's a groundswell of support. Uh, we're seeing it with our colleagues who want to be part of our, uh, our work at the Academy for Science and Freedom. And uh, we're going to continue forging ahead, uh, working together and getting, getting some of these done. So uh, I want to thank you again, uh, 
Dr. Martin Kaldor for adding your expertise. I we could talk uh, for hours about these things, and I I like to ha- I'd like to have you back again, and we can go into some detail as as things proceed. There's so much so much work to do uh, because I think you and I are true believers in science, and you know. The United States has uh, has been one of the great countries for scientific discovery, and to see this gross failure, this this backward move, as you said so poignantly once in one of your tweets, the age, uh, wondering if the age of enlightenment was over, uh, and and I think uh, it's really stunning that we are at at such a moment in history where we have to question that. Yeah, I hope it's not over, but uh, I'm not 100% sure. I'm concerned. I'm concerned myself. All right, Martin. Always a great pleasure talking to you, Scott. It's always Great to have you. And uh, again, thank you very much for doing this. Uh, It's a great pleasure, as always. Thank you for listening to Independent Truth with Scott Atlas. If you want to find out more about today's guest, Dr. Martin Koldorf, check out his website at Hillsdale College's Academy for Science and Freedom as well as his very important Twitter page. And don't forget to subscribe to the show on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Google, and anywhere else you're listening to podcasts right now. And I'll see you next time.